Hello, my name is Jorb. I love gear, and today, can I lift it in a frame? We're talking about the Moog Matriarch. It is a four oscillator, two filter, four voice paraphonic synthesizer. It's a lot of things to a lot of people. I think it's very, very interesting. You can tell because you've seen the runtime of this video and it's at least an hour. <laughs> Didn't plan on that. It's just the way things went. And this is sort of a throwback to, we'll call it season one Jorb, where I, it's not sponsored. I didn't really have a plan. I just learned something really, really well, and I sat down and I talked about it. And everything I wanted to talk about is what I ended up talking about. So, because I've seen the graphs, I know most of, most of you will not see the final minute of this. Uh, here's your spoiler for what I think about it. I think it sounds amazing. I think it completely stands apart from anything else in the synth market. And I think there's a sort of workflow aspect to the way you interact with it that I find really, really, really appealing. But so much of the stuff that I bought it to try and do, so much of the really complicated stuff requires so many stupid global settings and so much external patching that I don't know that I'll keep it or not. If that's all you wanted to hear, you're good, you can click off now. <laughs> but if you're curious about uh, some specifics on how to use it and what you can do with it and what I think it's good for, then stick around. If you're subscribed, thanks for coming back. If you're a patron, that means the world to me. If you aren't either, I encourage you to especially because this isn't sponsored. I'm making very little money off of this. Uh, look in the description and support me however you want. So there you go. Exposition is done. Let's talk about the gear. Here we are with the Matriarch. <laughs> no patches. This is all knob positions for this sound. Uh, the Matriarch is a really unconventional sort of signal routing and control configurations. And in a lot of settings, the controls are, are really, really unique and unconventional. It makes it kind of hard for me to demonstrate the way I normally do. But to speak very broadly, the architecture of this, you have four oscillators, you have two filters, two envelope generators, bunch of utilities, plenty of modulation, an ARP and a sequencer, two VCAs, and a stereo delay. And a bunch of ways to change the way you are controlling all of those things uh, with some switches here on the panel, some switches here, and some even some global settings. So a lot of conventional synthesizer stuff you need to sort of understand and then move past. <laughs> because a lot of what I'm doing and hearing right now isn't necessarily conventional synthesizer stuff, even though all the components that get there, that get us there, are the oscillators, the filters. Does that sort of make sense? Okay, there's that out of the way. <laughs> First thing you need to understand, there are three voice modes. This little switch labeled paraphony. In voice mode one, every key press controls all four oscillators. In two, the first key press is one and two. And then the second key press will be three and four. So, already super unconventional, and then paraphony 4, each key press gets assigned to a different oscillator. Very, very cool. One thing that's important to know about the uh, polyphony, the paraphony, before we go any further, I'm in voice mode 4, so a single note is a single oscillator, up to 4. If Even if I have settings on my envelopes that let my notes ring out. Not each of the volumes for each oscillator is independently articulated. Okay. So if I play a four note code alt chord all at once and I let go, the filter and the oscillator both come in together. But now if I'm holding three notes and I press and release a single key while those are still held, it doesn't get the release or the attack. It doesn't get the amp envelope. You hear that's just gated on when I press an additional note? 
this multi-trigger lets you trigger each of these only two. They're not duplicated behind the panel. There are actually only two envelopes. And the multi-trig lets us trigger them for every key press or only on the first one. Okay, if I'm playing in such a way that doesn't re-trigger the envelopes, either with or without this multi-trig on, then any new notes are just gated on and gated off. They've got just a little bit of a leeway to let you release, you know, and it's not super tight on the timing of the release. And you can have them all four fade out together. You might see that as a quirk, you might see that as a limitation, but it is just something unique uh, about the way the Matriarch has decided to handle its polyphony. Something to demonstrate now, even in voice mode one, where I'm controlling all four oscillators at once, they can be totally different settings. Okay, or if I'm in uh, voice mode four, where I'm playing a different note on every key press, and I've changed the global setting where it round robins through these oscillators. That to me is sort of the Korg monopoly thing. Like this setup right now, I'm gonna cycle through the four oscillators. If I just play three notes repeating. Sounds way more complicated than just playing those three notes over again. Well, with identical settings on the four oscillators. Okay, so you get what I'm saying. From the get-go, you can get pretty, like, unconventional stuff very, very fast on the Matriarch. <laughs> and I think it matters to know that before you dive in, right? Because almost none of the way you control it is, is truly conventional, and I think that is what's the most special about this, is sort of from the get-go, you're in new and unique territory. I really, really like that. Uh, I've got a lot of little complaints, and I'll get through all those later, but now I feel like I can go to a totally basic sound. <laughs> We can listen, and I can go through the way I would normally go through explaining what's available to us on any keyboard. So, my voice mode is on one, so I'm triggering all four oscillators, but only oscillator one is turned up in the mixer. So I'm using this as a single oscillator monosynth right now. And each oscillator of our four can be a triangle, a sawtooth, or two different pulses, and they can be modulated uh, with our CV inputs there. Or from this mod bus on the far left. They go down to 16 feet. If I introduce a second oscillator. hear that it's really really big really really dense the way sync works you need to enable sync for any oscillator and then as you press these buttons each oscillator will sync to the one before it so if i press sync on and on oscillator two this button oscillator two is synced to oscillator one if i turn down oscillator one Same thing, if I have sync on, for example, uh, oscillator 4 will sync back to oscillator 3, and that's labeled on the panel like that. Awesome, I'm going to keep just the two of them on. I'm onto the mixer, it is based on, actually all of the modules are, are based on old Moog uh, modular circuits, so I think it would be oscillators, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll flash on screen what it actually is. The mixer is based on the CP3, and the CP3, one of the things that makes the CP3 the CP3... <laughs> If you go above about 75%, you start to overdrive. So you can see that soft clipping on the oscilloscope. And you can hear that it's sort of a low end change. Uh, maybe more obvious with the triangle here. So to have them mixed in clean is about 75% here on the mixer. But I'm going to bring in all four oscillators. And already...
ready, this is kind of a huge sound. And then I tip all four of these channels up to full. Huge, huge, huge. Have four oscillators is crazy. And we have this analog sort of super soft. I bring it back clean. So, so, so cool. I'm going to come back to sort of advanced routings later, but there's your oscillator and your mixer, really. There's also a noise channel. That uh, just the same distorts. Okay, I'm going to go back down to just two oscillators. Something reasonable, and I'm on, again, our voice mode one. Every key press is every oscillator. This mixer mixes down in mono, okay? So your four oscillators oscillators in the mixer, that is a mono signal path into our filter. So where things get a little more unconventional, uh, we sort of ramp up. This is two filters, one on the left and one on the right in this configuration. Okay, so if I'm in filter mode stereo, that's a low pass and a low pass. I think that's the easiest place to hear a lot of these changes. First and foremost, it sounds good. Loses a ton of bass, as a classic Moog uh, filter does. I'm going to drive it a little harder. Awesome. Okay, so let's focus on the stereo stuff. We have separate resonance controls for uh, filter 1 and filter 2, even though we have this one master cutoff. So let's listen. I hear that extra resonance on my right. It's actually because you lose so much low end, the, the level really is different on the left and right when you do that. But resonance one, filter one, I hear on the right side in this stereo configuration. Uh, and what the spacing does, it just changes the cutoff for filter one. Spacing is just a cutoff offset for filter one. I don't love that configuration. Uh, I'll, com I'll put all my complaints in one section later, but it makes a lot of usage of two filters uh, a little trickier because of that. Uh, but if you just use it subtly, like a lot of these things, subtly or simply, if I set slightly different resonances and I change the spacing a little bit, we're getting this sort of apparent stereo image, and I'm actually going to introduce some of the um, both the envelopes now. I'm going to go back to our four voice mode. Already is like kind of unique because we have that stereo separation. Having it just enough to end up with a stereo image. I think it's very, very cool. But all that stereo stuff, forget it. Because <laughs> the other two modes don't do it. Uh, so I'm going back down to just two oscillators. This left mode series, high pass and then low pass, mono from the mixer into a high pass filter. That would be uh, filter one. Okay, remember we can control that with our spacing here. So in series like this, we've effectively made a bandpass filter, and spacing defines the width of that band. So I put it way high up. Really, really thin band. Or I suppose it's, I should specify a dual peak bandpass. If I get that sort of moving with our envelopes on the quicker. That's what I want to hear, and then I'm going to introduce some modulation. I 
I like that. I wish I could just switch either side to a band pass, uh, but it does pretty cool stuff. And this parallel, high pass and then low pass, mono from the mixer, that gets duplicated. That signal becomes two signals, one on a high pass, one on a low pass, and then those get mixed back together. So you'll always pretty much hear... <laughs> Pretty cool. I think without external patching, that's probably the least useful one. Uh, depending on my patch, I go between the first two a lot. I don't find myself using the third without any external patching, especially. <laughs> Back to where we were, I'm going to skip over these utilities for now. They'll matter once we start patching stuff. Uh, I've shown you the envelopes implicitly more than enough. This stereo delay. We have one time and one feedback knob on top. It is analog. Sounds really, really nice. Spacing here is just changing the time of one of our delays. So again, I hope you're listening in stereo. Here's full mix. Spacing short. Listen to your right side first. I'm going to turn spacing all the way up. Listen to your right side again. And with spacing all the way up, you'll hear left side first. So spacing is, in the way I have my left and right, <laughs> this is offsetting just, I think it's delay two. Okay, mix back. Uh, I think spacing works better here than it does um, on the, uh, than it does on the filters. But the way the routing is happening here, after the filter we get split again one and two, the left delay and one to the right delay. Okay, and everything on the right stays on the right and everything on the left stays on the left, unless we use ping pong, and then the feedback from one delay gets crossed over to the other. So I get their times really different. You get these patterns emerging, uh, and things sort of bouncing around in stereo. It's like a little lower. I'm going to go to our four voice mode, bring in our other oscillators. Less dramatic, but shorter. Listen, sort of, don't listen very specifically, I guess I'm trying to say, but just sort of feel the way the stereo image feels. It's sort of dense at these time and space settings, but if I, I take off ping pong... That feels very down the middle to me. I, I suppose it doesn't move as much, I should say. So I think this stereo delay at the end of all of this matters so, so, so much for the sort of inherent character of this whole keyboard. And certainly in terms of what you hear, or the way it feels, so much more of just like, ah, I hear a stereo image, you know what I mean? This is coming out as a stereo thing happens in this middle filter mode, <laughs> and because of the delay, than, than anything else. I think having a delay at the end of this matters so, so much. It ends up giving you a lot of the cool sounds in the Matrix. I keep, just out of instinct, playing more than four notes. So, so, so cool. Okay, but I have to bring it back down, I'm sorry. <laughs> to show off the VCA mode, so there's three. Drone, there's wide open. Both VCAs are wide open, and you can control them with external sources here, or some internal patching if you'd like. 
uh, to these VCA CVs in. One left and one right. Uh, on amp envelope, this one envelope will control both, the left and the right. On split, uh, let's do settings like this. The right envelope amplitude goes to one of the VCA CVs, and the filter envelope goes to the other one. So listen again, left and right. I just hold them up. Just on our right. Just on our left. Oh, I just flicked that paint off. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> wow. That's great. Good build quality, I guess, huh? Uh, huh. Yeah, I really sent that flying. <laughs> I'm gonna have to add, fix that. Anyway, <laughs> thank God that's on film. Paint flying um, ignored. That's just our right. That's just our left. So now here's another place to introduce some slight stereo movement. Even if you have them like sort of in the same spot. Okay, and the way the envelopes trigger this multi-trig uh, in interacts with this paraphony a lot. So this is where, again, things get a little tricky. Just even talking about this multi-trig, you really need to understand what's happening. Otherwise, the behavior is going to be really kind of surprising. But in most unpatched scenarios, you have a mono signal coming out of the mixer into the filters, right? Uh, but you want those filters to trigger with your key presses, of course. And, and we only have two envelope generators, right? So if I'm in voice mode one, I have multi-trig off. I don't re-trigger the envelopes whenever I press a new key. If I have multi-trig on, I do. Okay, that makes perfect sense. In two-voice mode, it feels a little more natural. And in four-voice mode, it might feel the most or the least natural, depending on what you're doing with your hands. So if I play all four notes at once, that is what I want it to do. That is how I want it to sound. Okay. But if I hold one note and move my other hand around, hear that low end, that low note. Actually, I'll make that loudest in the mixer. So this low note, every time I press another one, I know I'm, I'm, I'm making it more dramatic here in the mixer. That low note gets lifted up because I'm triggering this filter envelope. It's one envelope. But every time I press a key, it gets triggered. That's moving up. Right now, it's affecting both filters at the same time. Okay, so that's a sort of quirk of the of the paraphony, the polyphony. That I think you need to understand, otherwise, if you're used to playing on other synthesizers, you really be, you'd be sort of surprised by the behavior. Why do I hear so much more on my left right now? Like it's spacing right. Okay, I like I said, it's it's sort of hard for me to to stay on track with this because so many things affect so many other things, but. Um, if I go all the way back to this modulation bus, I've also tr been trying not to complain <laughs> while I go through, hey, this is everything and how it works. Uh, and I find that very, very difficult here on the Matriarch. There's a lot of little things I want to go, why does this work this way or why doesn't it work any differently? So this modulation bus actually is, is the same section of the sub-37 that I found very, very frustrating. In concept, I, I love what it is. It's one LFO, a bunch of different waves, and a variable amount to your pitch cut off and pulse width. Okay, and so as long as I have something set up, and I bring it up, it'll modulate all that. Okay, uh, my complaint comes because it always is brought in by the mod wheel. I wish there was just some sort of either like a one knob that was a global amount and I didn't have to necessarily use uh, the mod wheel for this or a switch to decide if it was the mod wheel. Anything that would let me disconnect the mod wheel from this would be great. I can't help but complain about that. <laughs> and I can't help but complain about this. So here I am, even at 50% on the mod wheel, 
only modulation is going to be pitch. Listen to how dramatic that already is. Okay, I'm glad it can go that high, but the taper of this knob is just so bad for it. It's too much at about 40%. Okay, gets a lot better when I bring the mod wheel down. But if I want the most, like, super subtle, let's just do one oscillator. I want super subtle pitch modulation. That's about my limit of good control, and that's using half the mod wheel. Because at full, it's too much. That, the taper, that's all wrong. <laughs> I can't help but complain about that. Okay, <laughs> on to something positive. <laughs> I really like that you have this pitch mod assigned to just be oscillators 1 and 3, or 2 and 4, or all 4. Because say, let's, I'm in my voice mode 1, all four oscillators are going to play, uh, but I'm only modulating the pitch of one and three. It just comes off as the oscillators beating against each other. In a way I really, really, really like. myself. How about some delay? And you know, why don't we just leave this sound on and I'll show you this far left section in ARP and a sequencer. So if I'm in ARP, this first mode here, and I press play down here, does what you'd expect. I hit hold. Who could have guessed? It'll hold that. I can sync our delay time to that. See how this LED is yellow now? It's not changing time here. It's giving us different divisions of our master tempo. Same thing for spacing. I got kind of lost there, <laughs> but I had to bring that up. Uh, our options here, so directions can be... So our directions can be the order I press the notes in. Let's make this a little more listenable. So huge. The order we press the notes in. Forward and back, or random. Like that. And we can cover one, two, or three octaves. There's also a sequencer. And so you have these three banks of four sequences. So right now, since I'm in sequence mode, this isn't our octave, it's our bank. So if I'm in uh, octave one, sequence four, and I hit play, that's what I've recorded in there. If I go to bank two, something else, bank three, Something else. <laughs> if I want to record over that, top switch, top switch to the right for rec, and then I just play. And then 
I have to switch this back to sequence and hit play. And our forward and back and random work for this as well. Uh, there's tons of global settings to change the specific ways this behave. If you have a specific need for, like, even the forward and back behavior can be changed. If you have a specific need for, like, the sequencer, check that out. It's it's much deeper than I thought it was. Uh, but in its sort of, this is, I guess, would say factory state, um, it's really, really useful. Okay, and if I go back to record, and I'll do some rest and some ties this time. Rest, rest, tie, tie, ratchet, ratchet. So, gotta go back to sequence and then play. Change some octaves. Change some pitches. Get our paraphony to voice mode 4. Bring in all our oscillators. That super boring patch, that super boring pattern can be something really, really interesting. One thing I should mention, because I found it really, really cool. You can use these as sort of performance controls while the sequences are running. So if I... Hold the ratchet, it'll always ratchet. Rest will always rest. Ties a little harder here, but there you go. I, I think the sequencer and the are super, super capable. Being able to sync over here is awesome. And I know I haven't talked about patching yet. And we can have our modulation synced to the stepping sequencer as well. That's all of the modules on their own. Yes, I didn't mention the utilities, uh, and there are some ins and outs in the back row, but those all come into play in our next section where we talk about patching. The matriarch is semi-modular. There's all these ins and outs you can use to route signals and modulate and, and change the audio path. All sorts of flexibility comes from this top row, and I've recorded this twice already, and I didn't like either time. I tried to find examples of using every module you know, to patch in or patch out. And, and while I think I was getting some good information out there, it was so dense and it was so long and it didn't feel good. Uh, plus, everything interacts with everything else. So trying to structure it like that just didn't work. So what I've decided I'm going to do, I'm just going to sit down and show you a couple of the things I find myself wanting to do over and over and over on the Matriarch. Uh, but show you those in pretty close detail. Step you through every patch cable so you understand what I'm doing. And maybe it'll sort of spark your ideas for the flexibility of this. Okay, okay, so first things first, I want to get some stereo filter movement, and the way I've been doing that is the wave out of our Modbus modulation here into this multiplier, this multiple, and then out of that multiple into each of these attenuators, and then each of those attenuators out to one of the cutoffs of our filter. And I hope you're listening in a way that lets you Identify some stereo separation here. And I'm going to push one attenuator negative and one attenuator positive. And so we have this stereo panning achieved with the filter. I love that. Slow and subtle to any pad type sounds. Or even a little faster. If that sine wave is a little too cyclical for you, we can go to a random wave. Great, perfect. Uh, I. Along the way, I'll try and give you real nuggets, okay? <laughs> so here in this stereo filter configuration, we're modulating them both. Uh, notice that when I plug in a CV jack into one or two, there's a lot of semi-modular synths that would break the normaling with that, right? Now, I wouldn't be controlling these with the same things, or maybe the panel controls wouldn't be connected uh, to the cutoff or wouldn't still be controlling the cutoff. Uh, but 
But the matriarch, in almost every case, does not break normaling when you plug into these panel jacks. So all the stuff that controlled these cutoffs before... This envelope... Uh, in this case, that's this envelope spacing and the cutoff knob. They all still affect our cutoff. Okay. Great. One of the things I like to just think about with your rack ever is once I set up a modulation, how do I modulate it? How do I change what this is changing, you know what I mean? How do I make something that might be static, not static? And so the easiest way and something I consistently have been doing is sending the envelope out to modulate the rate of our first LFO. So if I make it something like this... You can hear, over the course of that decay stage... We get a slower, steadier envelope. Now, I think that starting off really fast... And slowing, you know, near audio rates and then slowing down is really, really cool. But if I want to slow that down, I can go to this attenuator. Or maybe this affects it in reverse, because these attenuators are positive or negative modulation. So over time, this can speed up. Love that. Let's say maybe I don't want it to be connected to my key press. I want to modulate it with another LFO. Well, thank God, got another LFO here. Lovely, lovely, lovely. So yes, I guess just a closer look detail at the utilities. This is a multiple case that's one in, three out. Uh, you can mix through it. I don't know if you should be mixing through it, but <laughs> uh, these attenuators are bipolar. So they can positively modulate or negatively modulate the signal. Uh, and they work as VCAs. They have CV control over this amount. And this simple LFO has a right in triangle or square out. Okay, so there's a lot of patches, a lot of other patches, where I found myself wanting this sort of stereo movement. And I think it comes from me being frustrated that spacing wasn't something I could modulate. Uh, so I like this sound, it's cool, but I've already taken up every one of my attenuators and one of my multiples to accomplish it. So, while all this, like, onboard utility is really, really appreciated, and these truly are, like, as fully featured as you could want out of attenuators, and a multiple does exactly what it needs to. Uh, but it takes so many utilities to do a few things. When, if spacing was modulatable, or if, like, a lot of other semi-modular synths, to credit Create Audio at Pittsburgh Modular... That's a good example. So like oscillator FM here. While oscillator FM is normaled to the LFO, if I plug something in here, now this is attenuating a different signal. We don't have that at all for the oscillators. We don't have that at all for the filter. So to have attenuated control of anything um, is instantly taking up one of our utilities. And I, I don't want to just like be cynical about it because it, the panel is beautiful. It looks wonderful. And that is absolutely a part of product design, <laughs> making this look cool. But just a couple more knobs, uh, even if it's just in the filter section, man, or just changing the way like a jack like that works, that to me sort of expands the, you know, self-patching flexibility of this a million times.
Uh, but I can already hear comments saying, you know, Jorb, don't you know that uh, by being limited, you're being more creative? And I, in a lot of cases, do 100% agree with you. Uh, but we're just teetering on the edge of so much more possibility, and that's all I can think about. <laughs> uh, awesome. You know, I'm just going to keep adding, actually, to this same patch. I should mention, I'm using the Chroma Console for reverb. Sounds great, but I'm going to turn it off right now because <laughs> we're going to talk about the delay. Another like small thing that I find myself really, really liking. So with the stereo delay on. On the back, I'll just have to get another shot of this because I don't want to change all my framing. Do I get a bigger cable? Because of course I do. I can see in the like the cable forbidden zone, the biggest pile. I can see one of my long Eurorack patch cables. <laughs> Damn it. Got more though. Another patch that I find myself really, really liking is controlling the feedback of the delay with the keyboard CV. So the higher I am on the keyboard, the longer the feedback is. Okay, so now I have, let's listen to it without, if I, perhaps something like this, slower and less. That's what I'm working with now. So now I have the keyboard CV coming into the feedback CV input. If I press a high note, that feedback effectively is turned way, way up. So only the high notes ring out like that. same octave here. Let's say, maybe for example, I want to modulate the delay times. I can make this sort of a chorus-y. So if I send the triangle out of here into this attenuator, and I send the output of that attenuator to, let's say, time one. I just pulled out a beard hair with the microphone. <laughs> So subtle, and that's kind of the same complaint as this this pitch amount here. Just barely any, and I and I know that's both things related to pitch and maybe that's on me. Faster time and a lower mix. Or a full wet mix just to really hear it. Honestly, I like that a lot. Ping pong is just too good on the delay. Oops, four. Make this slower. Bring these up. Thank you. 
Uh, now, instead of having anything else control the rate of the modulation, I'm controlling it with its own sample and hold, so it'll just be changed at random. I'm happy with that. Some nice subtle movement, some space. Let's listen without the delay. Something I wasn't crediting it for, but it really is doing at this sort of reasonably high uh, mix setting. It's sort of dampening that stereo difference. It's sort of softening, you know, the really clear perception of um, modulating the left and right filters opposite of each other. Yeah, really, really happy with that. I'm going to reset everything. I think I've shown you what I need to show you with that. Uh, and something else that I find myself wanting to do a lot with four oscillators, you get a lot of chances to do some wackier stuff. <laughs> so first thing I'll show you isn't that complicated, but it's something we haven't quite done yet. So if I, from the linear FM in, get the wave out from two back to one and four back to three, and then I put our paraphony on two, Okay, so each key press is going to be one and two, and then three and four. Turn these way high up. Put them on the triangles. Put everything on triangle. We've got our sort of pretty simple FM. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Right now we're just listening to oscillators one and three, so the two that are getting modulated, but if we just listen to two and four... Cool, cool, cool. Let's bring everything back in. That's all well and good, but a little unwieldy for me, even if I do like FM tones. I don't. I just don't know what to do with them once I get there. Uh, something else I found myself really, really enjoying. This is the filter envelope into this attenuator, and then out of that attenuator into this multiple, and then out of this multiple, I'm going to modulate the pitch of again oscillators two and four, and I'm going to sync them back to oscillators one and three. Okay, so let's mixers down at zero. I just want to hear oscillator two right now. Okay, turn on sync. So presumably, if I get these at about the same settings, which I should put that on a sawtooth. 
don't hear anything. Why is that? The the modulation inputs on the oscillators are all cascading. So if I plug pitch in to any of these, it goes to all the ones after it. One will get normal to two, three, and four. Two will get normal to three and four. Three will get normal to four. And if I want to modulate, you know, two and four separately, for example, I need to interrupt that patch at three. So I have a dummy cable in three, and now... <laughs> I can hear four modulated by just this cable, because right now, the problem is three. So if I listen to one right now, it's where it is without any patch cable. Three, you'd think it would be the same? Nope. Okay, so I want to hear four and two. Having two, by the way, back to just like, let's think core principles. I've got four oscillators. I can have two synced pairs. <laughs> Love that, love all that. Uh, luckily for us, if I want to modulate these instead with uh, the LFO, one of the things that's set up really, really nice, uh, you know, considering the rest of the setup, is this pitch being only sent to 2 and 4, or 1 and 3. So if I now bring in the mod wheel... Because if I was on all, I'd get these sort of ghost pitch warbles. But just on two and four, the ones that are synced to one and two. That's just modulating our timbre. So that was just kind of a way to show you, like, hey, these cascade. But they don't all do that. Not all the CV jacks do that. I've got Wave out into Linear FM, for example. So let's just listen to Oscillator 1 in the mixer. Okay, if that normaling uh, was consistent, right now I could turn on Oscillator 3. And I would expect it to sound like this. But it doesn't do that. So how about uh, Pulse Width Modulation? If I plug that into 1... Actually, let's get that from over here. So I plug our LFO into pulse width modulation. Yeah, it does it. Now, do you think I'm going to hear that pulse width modulation on two? Guess. Nope. So only the pitch in is normal to cross all of these. I Do I like that? Do you like that? <laughs> I think inconsistent behavior that's unlabeled is pretty confusing. Why would pitch work differently from other th uh, these other things? Who can say? Okay, just to show you more normaling, let's do cutoff one from our LFO here. Oh, resonance two, I can hear. That uh, filter two is also affected by cutoff one. Anyway, I don't need to show you everything, but uh, that's something I, I find kind of frustrating is that there's inconsistent behavior of uh, the way these CV jacks are and aren't normaled. Cool. That's kind of all the like big like, hey, did you know this that I kind of want to show you? I think your brain's probably cooking for uh, possibilities on that. The last thing I wanted to show you was setting this all up as two separate voices, two two oscillator voices, because I can remember a Sonic State video where Nick Bat did Friday Fun, and he had the sequencer controlling something and the keyboard controlling something else. I thought that was such a clever use of all the modules, a clever allocation of all the modules in here. Well, you know, one filter to each voice, two oscillators to each, one filter to each side, blah, blah, blah. And yes, I still think that would be a cool example, and I still think it is a cool example, so you should still go watch 
uh, the inimitable Nick Bat <laughs> pull it off in his video. But there were so many steps, you know, in terms of global settings, there were so many steps. I would never want to do it. I would grab two separate synths. Uh, I'll point you to the much much more talented than me in 100 Ways Nick Bat for that Friday Fun video. I'll go looking for it. Uh, I think that's a really, really clever use of this. But my main point there is some of the coolest stuff you can do with this is behind so many uh, global settings changes, and they are a huge pain in the ass to get to. So let's give you a live example huh, of changing something as simple as your MIDI channel, okay? So if I want to get into global settings, I need to hold, hold, and hold sync enable, and then this red light will start to flash. And then MIDI input channel, the group select key, I need to press C sharp 2, 1, 2, C sharp, so I press C-sharp 2, we're in the right group, parameter select key, C-sharp 0, I press that. Okay, so now it's down there. And to change our parameters, for our mini input channel, I need to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I press one of these buttons to get there. I'm going to leave it on 1, I guess, because that's what I'm going to assume it's on next time. If you double press that, you're out. See, it stopped flashing. If you double press the same key, you get out of that global settings mode. I like that we have a ton of flexibility. I really do. And there's a ton of flexibility and stuff you wouldn't think would be in here. But, God, getting to them is a huge pain in the ass. Now, if I just go a few pages further, here's our MIDI documentation. I would think that perhaps, with such a cumbersome way to get to these global settings, perhaps they would be something I could change with MIDI, but they aren't. Um, I don't use software editors, so if there's a way to do it in software, good luck to you, uh, but that's not how I roll. So there you go. For some of the most interesting stuff you can do on the Matriarch, it takes this, like, super annoying combination of external patching and global settings that are really a huge pain to get to, uh, and that uh, makes it a little cumbersome. So all the stuff that I would love to try, I can't just try, I need to set up and leave it there. So let me sort of summarize, okay? I've just been, been shouting for a little while. <laughs> I love the Matriarch. I love how it sounds. I love what you can do on it. I love that it's unique in its own way. It doesn't feel like anything else on the market for a few reasons. For one, it's very comfortable sitting between two, I, I think, what certain boardrooms might see as totally separate product categories, a monosynth and a polysynth. It requires a certain understanding of, uh, you know, sort of typical version of, of one or either of those to, to really get what it's doing here. And I think that's commendable. There's shades of like the Monopoly and the Oscillators, tons of shared blood with other Moog stuff, but the whole of the Matriarch is, is completely unique. Moog hasn't done something like it before, and uh, I don't see anybody else putting out stuff quite like this. So I'm just stoked that it exists. I'm very, very happy I tried it. But all the stuff I was really, really hoping I could get it to do are a few external modules or uh, a few global settings <laughs> that I will never remember that are not easy to change. Uh, away. And for me, the sort of immediacy that's implied by something that is a knob laden interface with a bunch of, you know, manually patched cables that you can't have presets, that sort of is all about exploration. The way I want to sit and use something that presents itself like this is try something, try something, try something, try something, land on something cool, maybe record it. And so much of the stuff that I would want to try for five or ten minutes, I, I don't want to take the time to set up. And maybe that's because I'm not as familiar with it as I could be, uh, but simple things like having a switch here to disconnect the keyboard from the ARP and the sequencer, that would immediately make some of the two-voice stuff more capable. That combined with uh, a bunch of my little complaints, which I had complaints listed out. I'm not even going to read them. I'll put them in the description if you want. I have complaints for every section. They just don't feel relevant at this point, and I, and, I brought up, and, and I brought up the ones that frustrated me the most, so if you really care about my complaints, especially if you're at this point in the video, they're all on the bottom, but am I going to keep it? I'm not quite sure. I feel attached to it right now. That's probably because it's been the only thing I've used for maybe a whole week and a half. Uh, I'm going to spend some time with the Take 5 and sort of <laughs> refresh my I like using this keyboard feelings and, and sit down and come back to it. But uh, yeah, there you go. My name is Dorb. I love gear. and includes a lot of things about the Matriarch. Thanks for watching. Cheers and so long.